Good evening. Okay. So I'm, I've reached the stage in life where I have the choice of seeing my notes or seeing you. So you're, you're vaguely attractive enough that I'll go for seeing you. I've been asked to talk about penthouse pavement and about is the gap between rich and poor inevitable. And I, Before I do that, I just wanted to say a little bit about the team I work for, which is called the Joint Public Issues Team. And it is a team which joins together the Baptist, the Methodist, the Church of Scotland and the United Reformed Churches. And they are campaigning on public issues and are informing of churches on public issues we do together. And there's a practical reason for that, which is that I, that means that you can get someone who is an expert or someone who can focus on one issue for all four churches, which means they might be able to have something more informed to say. But the reason why it's such a joyous place to work is that, as, and I say this as a, as a good Methodist who's married to a Methodist, very occasionally a Baptist has a good idea. <laughs> and sometimes even people from the Church of Scotland have a good idea. And by working together and from seeing things from different perspectives, you get all sorts of new ideas and a lot of fun and a lot of sort of challenge within the work. So it's a team and we work on a number of, we work on a number of different issues. Poverty and inequality is what I cover. Um, David Bradwell from the Church of Scotland does our work around refugees and we do work around the environment, around elections and around things like gambling and alcohol as well. But I've been asked to talk about this. And I should probably say a little bit about myself, that I came to this job from being uh, someone who designed vaccines for a living, so I'm thoroughly unqualified. <coughs> I love data. I see the world in graphs, and sadly, whether you like it or not, so are you, in, in within the next sort of 40 minutes. And when I was asked that question, I sat and I thought to myself, what, what graph, what data should I go to? Should I go to sort of incomes data? Should I go to wealth data? Should I go to data about employment, about employment and stuff like that? And there was so much, I decided to come up with the really, really simple graph, which goes like this if it comes up. No. And we could just sit down and stop there. The gap between rich and poor is not inevitable. It straightforwardly is not, and I hope I will convince you of that, and if I don't, I will sit you down in the corner and talk to you afterwards until I do. But I thought I would start with a Bible verse, and it's not one, that it's the one that's used a lot in churches. The poor will always be with you, and when I talk about poverty in churches, often people say that. And it appears in three of the Gospels, and it appears in a story where it appears in a story where Jesus is given this. Somebody comes up to Jesus and anoints them with really, really expensive oil, and does it as a as a way of showing respect and honour. And then somebody says, and it's really interesting that in the Matthew reading it says one of the disciples said. In the Mark reading, it says, somebody about says. And then in the John reading, we, we're really, it makes it clear what we think about the question. What we think about the question says, Judas says, and he says it not because he cares about poor people, but, he care, but because he's a thief. Somebody says, but you could have sold that expensive perfume and used it to give it to the poor. And Jesus replies, amongst other things, the poor will always be with you. And many people, and that's often taken out of context to say, oh, but that means the poor will always be with you. It says so in the Bible. But the reference is really useful because it's a reference back to a part of the Old Testament. And it's a reference back to a it's a reference back to a chapter that is talking all about 
the way in which you run your society. It talks about debt, it talks about how you use land, it talks about how you use the surplus goods within your society. And it's a reference back to say that if, you, if you're talking about poverty, it's about how you run your society. It isn't about charity. And I thought this was a dangerous thing to bring up in the new room in Bristol. This is probably, this is, this is, I, I don't know how to phrase it. This is the first Methodist building, but it wasn't built as a Methodist building. It was built as a cannon factory. And Wesley took it over in, uh, I think, uh, 17, 1737. But the foundry was where the first Methodist society met in London and in it there was this worship space and it was about worshipping God but very quickly it was in a very impoverished area in London and very quickly they moved to providing services and to providing charity for the people around the for the people around the uh, the foundry building so they what we would recognize as a food bank and a clothes bank clothes bank sprung up quite quickly. But very quickly after that, they realized that the reason some people were, in, people were in poverty was around the structures in society. So here's a painting, and the caption underneath reads, here is a guinea to get your husband released from prison. And at that time, they, they knew that you went to prison because you were in debt. And in order to get out of prison, you had to pay back the debt. And not only that, you had to pay your room and board while you were in prison. Which meant that women who were left outside of prison had to do awful things in order to get enough money to bring the breadwinner back such that they could get on with their lives. And here we have this this nice portrait of Wesley handing money over and doing charity. But what they then did was they said, let's campaign to change the rules that mean that people go to prison, that mean that, that, mean that, that people have to pay themselves out of prison, and change the rules such that that doesn't happen. Because when we look at poverty and inequality today and back then, the place you need to look at is the rules that are within the society to find out why it happens. And this brings us up to today, or actually last year. The UN sent a, rapid, a special rapporteur to the United Kingdom. And if you haven't read his report, you should. It's only three pages and it will break your heart and fill you with shame. But this is the first sentence of the, of the conclusion. It said, the experience of the United Kingdom, especially since 2010, underscores the conclusion that poverty is a political choice. Now, I, I don't know whether it's deliberately or otherwise. Some politicians got very upset by that and said, I didn't sit down and say I want to create poverty. But that's not what Philip Allison's saying. He is saying that the policies you put in place did create poverty. And it was your choices, knowing or unknowing, that led to poverty increasing over the last decade. And really, the question is, why would you make that political choice? And I've got one I will give you one thought of an idea as to why that happens. And it's around how we view people who experience poverty in the UK. And uh, I don't know, I, I know there's at least one member of the clergy in the room. Are there any more? Yeah, okay, well, oh, two, yes. Well, I'm afraid this section is how... I, I, for, for, um, my wife, who is a Methodist minister, made me put this bit in. Because every year, 
or actually every three years since 19, 1981, people have been asked the question, why do you think pe children, there are pe people, e children experiencing poverty in the United Kingdom? And they're given a multiple choice. And they've been given the same multiple choice since then so we can track it over time. And when you ask the general public that question, about a fifth say injustice, about a quarter say laziness, bad luck, inevitable, and then there's people take other. And the, I, I had the joy of reading the boxes that you can fill in when you say other, and it makes me really wonder about the sanity of some members of the British public. But the Church of England did the same survey amongst Church of England, or took out churchgoers, which includes Church of England members and includes actually all churchgoers, and took them out of that survey and then graphed who, what churchgoers thought. And you find that churchgoers are almost identical to the rest of the British population. We think that probably child poverty is inevitable, and it's probably, and if it's not inevitable, it's probably caused by laziness. And then, and, I, and then the Church of England decided they'd ask their clergy. And clergy's view was very, very different. And I repeated this with uh, Methodist ministers and, and a few others and got the same result. And in Methodism as well, we got one person who said that it was laziness. And I found him. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was polite and I had to ask. And there's something really interesting was that that person was someone who had never been in circuit, who had never been in a, in, a, in a pastorate or had never been sort of a normal parish minister. And my, my feeling is that if you have to sit in someone's front room who's experiencing poverty and listen to their story and listen to how their life is the way it is today, it becomes really difficult to talk about laziness. It becomes really difficult to use condemning tone words. And actually, when you listen to people's stories, it just feels unjust that the person sitting in front of you is experiencing the poverty that you can see. And this is my last Wesley quote, but I really like it. And it's quite a long one. Said so one great reason why the rich in general have so little sympathy for the poor is because they so seldom visit them. Hence it is that one part of the world does not know what the other suffers. Many of them do not know because they do not care to know. They keep out of the way of knowing it and then plead their voluntary ignorance as an excuse for their hardness of heart. And my feeling is that the ministers who sat in people's front room if they had a hard heart, it had melted by the time they had got up from that cup of tea. And I thought, I'm, 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 you know, I can talk a lot about statistics and graphs and you'll get sick of them before the next half an hour is out. But lots of discussions about poverty in the UK are done by people like me. I am white, middle class, educated, I can draw graphs and I can explain things. That's what I do. Very few talks about poverty that you will hear will be done by people who are the real experts who live it every day. So we've got a, a short video from somebody in Glasgow. From, it was gathered by the Glasgow Poverty Truth Commission and filmed by uh, Joseph Rowntree Foundation. And it's just a little bit of one person's story about experiencing poverty in the UK. Hi, my name is Hazel. I'm a single mum from Fife. <laughs> my sons are 17 and 15. I have been on my own with them since their dad walked out when they were young. Since then, I've either struggled on benefits or I've been working. But with just one income, it's never been enough. 
I have worked full time for a good decent wage and then I have worked part time for minimum wage and there's never been much difference. When working full time I didn't get tax credits or housing benefit and I was living on my wage alone. Then working part time with a little top up of tax credits and housing benefit it still left me with no more than previously. For me to get a better wage and a decent quality of life, I would really need to be earning a much higher wage. If I compare things to an object, it would be a hamster's wheel. No matter how hard I work and how much I push myself, I still feel I'm getting nowhere. I feel like it's a never-ending journey with no end. It feels like I am working and pushing myself so hard, but I'm just going round in circles and going nowhere. And that experience of being in or out of work and of it being relentless and grinding and with no end in sight is the experience of poverty. And we often think about poverty as a food bank visit. And that is a point where you've reached bottom. But at one point uh, there, was a, there was work done by Church of England and Trussell Trust in which they sat down with food bank clients and they just took uh, they took sort of a, a section of their life. They said, tell me about when you felt good in your life and when you felt bad, and they drew it out. And what you had was people who, something had gone wrong, and then they were left in this difficult situation where they could not move forward and they could not see a way forward. And that has real profound effects in how you behave, it has real profound effects in how you act, and there's all sorts of sort of research I could tell you on that and I'm happy to talk about it later. But one of the things that's really important is that many people have a, have a view of poverty that's rooted in sort of the, the experience of the 1980s, where poverty was about unemployment and where poverty was about being uh, elderly and poverty was about uh, not having access to social security because either you were because of things around illness. Poverty in the UK has changed dramatically and I don't think our perceptions have moved, have moved along. So I thought I'd tell you a bit about what poverty in the UK looks like. We're using numbers from the Social Metrics Commission. There's been a big fight over how you count poverty over the past decade and it's been utterly pointless. We've now got to a Social Metrics Commission has been agreed across the political spectrum and across the sectors these numbers are as good as you're going to get. And, I, and to give you an idea of what experiencing poverty would be, I, again, uh, in, in a church setting, I, I would say, if you can think of a pensioner who's either getting all their rent paid by housing benefit or owns their own house, but they're living only in the state pension, their standard of living will be around about a third higher than the poverty line we're talking now. So we are not talking having a large amount of money here. We are not talking a line that defines something that isn't real poverty. And one of the things that's really important is that some people say poverty in the UK doesn't matter. Poverty abroad, that's, that's, hot, that's tough. Poverty here doesn't matter. Poverty here has huge effects on your life. It has huge effects on your health. It has huge effects on your life expectancy being in the bottom fifth and the top fifth call is about 10 years of, of life expectancy, about 22 years of healthy life expectancy at the moment. And this is just a graph that was done from last, a couple of weeks ago. And it's looking at a cohort of children and the richest primary school children, very few had, had mental health problems. Whereas when you got to the poorest fifth, so the ones who would count, probably count as experiencing poverty under that measure, you're getting to around a fifth of those children experience mental health problems. And I could draw you hundreds of graphs to say that poverty genuinely affects your life in the UK. What's interesting is that while in the peak of pensioner poverty was, two sorry, was 1993, 
93, and it peaked at 38% of pensioners lived in poverty. It's now down to around 14%. So pensioners are around 1.3 million of those who experience poverty. The group most likely to experience poverty are children, by a long way. Around about a third of children, 4.6 million, experience poverty, and around, just under, and around about a fifth of adults, 3.8 million, experience poverty and are of working age. But poverty in the UK today is about being in work, or it's about being unable to work because you're sick or have caring responsibilities. The people who are unemployed, they shift back and forward. There's lots of zero hours rubbish contract jobs that will give you that you'll be able to work for a week, but then you won't be able to work next week. So unemployment isn't this static thing that lasts for years in the same way as it once was. Unemployment is in and out, in and out, in and out of work. So when you look at poverty, you find 3.3 million people live in families where both adults are in full-time employment. That means working 35 hours a week or above and still they experience poverty. This group is one in full-time, one in part-time work, and this group is one person in part-time work. These are almost all single-parent families where, it is the, where it's normally the mother is in part-time work. And that, that's who experiences it. And so poverty is about being in work and the no work. Uh, 3.2 million of those are people who are getting benefits because they are unfit to work currently and the rest are around caring responsibilities so looking after young children or sick adults and one of the extraordinary features of the past decade is that our employment rate has been going up and up and up we're now at the highest employment rate that we've had since 19, the mid 1970s but at the same time as our employment rate has been going up and up and up our poverty rate especially our child poverty rate has been increasing so the mantra that work is the best way out of poverty, technically it's untrue, marrying is a better way out of poverty. I'm, I'm, I'm being filmed so I shouldn't tell this joke, but I always find it amusing that uh, a person married to the third Baroness Cottesloe used to make that mistake. Uh, Ian, Duncan, Ian Duncan Smith married uh, the third Baroness Cottesloe and used to say work is the best route out of poverty when it was marrying well. Who knew? But the idea that increasing work decreases poverty hasn't been true since about the start of this decade, of last decade, sorry. And what's important, and one of the other important things is some specific groups are much more likely to experience poverty in the UK. So people from ethnic minorities, much more likely to experience poverty. And that is true for first and second generation. So it isn't an immigration effect, it is an effect of being from an ethnic minority. Those who have disability or sickness are much more likely to experience poverty. And children are much more likely to experience poverty. And one of the really interesting things is the larger, if you've got a single parent, over half of single parents in the UK now experience poverty. And if you are in a family with more than two children, almost half of those experience poverty in the UK now. And one of the interesting, or interesting is an interesting word, one of the interesting things is that these are the groups for whom the benefit cuts of the last 10 years have been, have been focused upon. So there's something now which is slowly rolling out called the two child rule, which means that you only get benefits for the first two, or you only get universal credit for the first two children in a family. You still get child benefit. Which means that, and I had this really, I was at a center in Bermondsey on a, a mother and toddlers group. And Th they're, they're fantastic people and it became entirely clear I wasn't needed. So I sat on the floor and played with some babies because my, my children are grown up and I'm not having any more so it's my only chance. 
and I was sat with one child who the state was prepared to support on one side and one child who the state wasn't. Yet it just seemed to have no logic that this child here the ch <laughs> has essentially been abandoned and that feels extraordinarily just an extraordinary thing to do. But this is data from the uh, uh, the uh, ECHR, I think. But it is how much has been lost to the to families of these of these types in benefits uh, over the past decade, and it includes. It's a, it's a really interesting measure done by them because it includes changes to taxes, so when taxes decrease it includes that, and it includes changes to benefits, and it includes changes to average wages. But single adults without children, very limited effect. Single adults with children are losing an average £5,000 a year. Sing couples with children who are less likely to experience poverty or without children who are less likely to experience poverty, very little. And it's about £3,000 a year for families who are in a couple and have children. So these cuts have been focused on those, on, on children. And one of the other things that is important is that poverty isn't focused on the young. And it used to be that when you hit school age there's a bump in this line so that once you got off school age that you, you sort of went off to university you established yourself and the the poverty rate changed and there was a, a, a real there was a real noticeable difference there isn't really now that basically your risk of poverty is proportional to your age or inversely proportional to your age the older you are the less likely you are to experience poverty in the UK and one of the things that, I f that is particularly worrying is that, and I, I'm looking at these three in the front row here, and, and, and don't, wish, don't wish to depress you too much, but we now know that after university, graduate jobs are less likely. So you, m large numbers of graduates are getting jobs you don't need a, graduate, you don't need a degree for. But not only that, the average wages even of the graduate jobs are lower than they would have been 10 years ago for a graduate. So the standard of living of that, of that level of age has shunted down. And there was a hope two or three years ago that that was just an effect of there having been a recession. But it looks like it's following through. It looks like this whole cohort is going to experience that reduction in wages and going to experience it for the indefinite future and you and I'll talk about that in a minute so we've talked about what poverty looks like in the UK and uh, in the beginning I said that it is policy what changed it that those changes that it didn't change from being out of work to in work just by some you know, a, because of the weather. It changed because we chose to change the rules in our society such that it happened. So the reason it changes are changes to the economy and how the underlying economy runs and also changes to the way the welfare safety net works. So I'm afraid you're going to get some serious graphing now. And I love Sorry, I just love this graph. It took me ages to draw, and, and I, <laughs> I ran around my office and got everybody to look at it <laughs> and, and tell me it was lovely when I'd finished it. I was very pleased. But what it is is a graph of incomes. And this is the 90th centile, so, the, so the, if you had 100 people, this would be the person with the 90th highest level of income. This would be the person with the 50th, and this would be the person with the 10th. And it runs from 1961 all the way till uh, two years ago now. 
and it takes into account inflation and it takes into account tax changes and it takes into account uh, or direct tax changes and it takes into account uh, uh, it takes into account benefits so this is what households had and you see that the poorest households don't really benefit a lot these are economic good times or certainly during the economic good times they don't really benefit a lot medium incomes increase steadily but the thing you notice is that the higher incomes shoot up and they shoot up in particular around the 1980s and that was because we reset the way our economy worked during that time and there's something called the Gini coefficient and it's just a measure of inequality within a country and you see that during the 1980s we have this big increase in inequality and actually income inequality has stayed fairly static since then so people talk about rising inequality they don't mean income inequality because it stayed static but there were changes to the way in which we incentivized companies to pay people there were changes in the way in which there were changes in the way in which wages were negotiated that ra radically changed how distribution of wa the distribution of wages and so we see from here to here the proportion of, of the profits of companies that goes to the workers decreases and the prof proportion that goes to the people who own it so the so if you invest in a company you made more whereas if you worked for a company you got proportionately less and one of the other things that happened was that owning things became the way in which you got wealthy if you owned a house I, I can remember I can remember in the mid in the mid 2000s my brother had bought a house at Edinburgh and it's a very small flat and it was making more money in increased asset price each year than he was making working as a bursar in a school full time so his household wealth was increasing more quickly through owning the house than it was increasing through through the work at sweat of his brow and being a bursar in a school is a lot of sweat and so we see that asset prices in, and here we have housing which is the major asset that households often hold increased so if you had the money to own the house or to buy a house then you were okay or you could get on this train but if you didn't you were left behind and one of the things and again I, I, I should have put a warning up for you guys today there's no option for young people to buy down here this is the price of a house now so that so getting onto that tree and even if you think the asset price is going to keep rising which you know I'm not a financial advisor so I'm not going to tell you whether I think it is or not but even if you think it is the price of getting on that train is so much higher which means that unless you are lucky enough to have parents who are going to help you you're going to be left behind and again there are all sorts of ways in which policy allowed that to happen one of the big things and I one of the big things is that it used to be banks could only lend a certain amount of money in way to mortgages to housing because it was recognized it was a really safe bet for the bank so we regulated them and said you can have this many safe bets as long as you do some other bets you do some bets on investing on industries or on technologies that might generate income for the nation and that was part of the deal you got to you got this license to lend money but you had to lend it in specific ways that was all ripped away and suddenly banks really quickly realized that the best thing you could do is invest in an asset bubble because if it all goes wrong you can sell that and it made sense to them and there's all sorts of other little ways in which we promoted that
And here we have measuring the total wealth of a household is much harder than measuring its income. But we've now got the Office of National Statistics, who are fantastic, have started to measure the total wealth of households in, each con in, in the UK and does, does so every sort of three years now. And one of the surprising things, and the things you might think of, is during this last decade when incomes have been absolutely static, when it was last week we announced that we, the, average, the average weekly wage packet has reached the level of 2008 again. That happened last week. So even though incomes are low, strangely, wealth has increased. It's gone down considerably for the people in the lowest income decile, as you might expect. But it's gone up considerably for people in the top decile again. So again, wealth is it being accumulated. And there's, a, there's a number of mechanisms, housing and pensions and various other investments are doing that. And again, policy chose to do it. I don't know, uh, have any of you heard of the phrase quantitative easing? It's a glorious thing. It's, it, 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 you just print the money. You just, in fact, you just type it into an Excel sheet and the money exists. And so what the government does is it buys back its own debt. So we printed the money to buy from the bond markets about a third of the national debt. The reason it did it was it inflates the price of assets. I could explain why, but you'll get very bored and it'll take too long. But the point is, we inflate the price of assets. So our policy choice was to inflate the price of assets because we hoped that would stimulate the economy and make it, make it run again after the, after the recession. Makes sense. The other thing it does is it increases inflation, which again, you might want to do to get yourself out of a, to get yourself out of a recession. But what we chose to do was we chose to freeze benefits so that by printing all this money, we increased inflation, but the inflation weighed on the poorest because their benefits didn't rise with inflation, they stayed flat. But we also chose to inflate the price of assets, which was owned by people who are wealthier in society. Which meant it was a set of two policies together, which quite literally took from the poor and gave to the rich. So the average the average increase in wealth for the top 10% of uh, top 10 of earners in the United Kingdom from the quantity of Zoom program has been estimated at around a quarter of a million pounds each. That is substantial amounts of money. And to be fair, they didn't, it wasn't their fault and they didn't, it didn't feel like it was coming in because as assets inflate, you don't feel much wealthier. But that is what happened. So I've talked a bit about the changing face of poverty. In the 1990s, 1980s, it was about unemployment, old age and children. And now it's about in-work and part-work. It's about young adults. And I think that's the, that's the one that causes me most concern. Because it, if that is a cohort effect and those young adults don't get a stake in society, we'll have let them down immensely and it will have all sorts of social consequences. It's increasing child poverty. And the last one is higher risk. <coughs> and that higher risk has all sorts of effects. And the higher risk is that if you fall in today's society, you've got a long way to go, and when you land, it is hard. The safety net is, does not cushion, your blow, cushion the blow as much as it used to. Being poor in the UK is really tough. And the risk of that happening is something that causes people worry. And we've had, uh, the, we've had new data out from, uh, called PESA, which is around the well-being of children, and it's around schools. And one of the interesting things is that the children in the UK are much more anxious, much more likely to be depressed. Children in the UK are much more worried about their future, much more likely to say that life has no meaning than others in Europe. 
and, and, and the Daily Mail headline was about social media. Latvian children use social media too. They use it more than ours, but they don't feel the same way. There's something more profound going on than Facebook. And I'm not saying it's all about economy and it's all about that, but I think it's a warning sign. And certainly, objectively, the risks of becoming poor are much higher in the UK today than they were. And I'll flick over that. I've got a couple of minutes. I wanted to tell you about universal credit, and if you want to hear about universal credit, I will lecture you for hours. But after all I've said, and for the last seven or eight years, I've gone around different churches in the country and just depressed people and left. It was great. <laughs> Whereas now, I have to say I am hugely positive about the next decade. I genuinely think we're in a moment of change and we're at a time of change. And I've put up this slide. They want these, this, these three won the Nobel Prize. The, uh, for or the Nobel Memorial Prize for Economics uh, this year. And they have a different view of economics than the view of economics that has caused these problems. They are economists who are essentially experimental. They don't have grand theories where uh, they don't have grand theories where you put in numbers and you say I shall incentivize people by giving them this money and taking away this money and they shall behave in this way. So universal credit, it takes money away from people and literally the, it said I'm going to take 32 pounds a week off people who have been declared unfit for work and because I have done that, that will incentivize them to go out to work and it will make the well-being of their children better. That, it says that in black and white in the impact assessment of taking money off people assessed as unfit for work. The people for whom that, the economists for whom that made sense are going out of favour. And people like Esther Dufflow who view economics as a, as much more of a soup of humanity and money and, and view people as having all sorts of different motivations other than selfishness and other than money and other than self-interest. And that understanding that people might be more complicated than that is really important. And I think they are coming into the ascendancy and those ideas are coming to the ascendancy because, frankly, the only purpose of these policies was to increase our gross domestic product and make us wealthier year in year. And it stopped working. It's not delivering anymore, which means everybody knows something has to change. And these are the ideas that it looks like it's going to change towards. And I want to go back to where I started, which is around, uh, which is around sitting in somebody's front room and having a cup of tea. That policies about poverty have traditionally been made in Caxton, in Caxton Street in the Department of Work and Pensions, where people with nice graphs and nice suits and nice educations, worked out what was wrong with the poor and then tried to fix them. And, you know, people from left and right have thrown down grand schemes and policies onto the heads of people who experience poverty. And each of them have failed in their own interesting way. Universal credit is the latest and possibly one of the most disastrous in a long line. But this is a video which you can get, it's free, it's on The Guardian, called Fighting Shame, uh, it's a documentary. And it's about a Poverty Truth Commission. And Poverty Truth Commissions are where people who experience poverty get together and they share their stories. And they talk to each other and once they are confident, unable, uh, once they are confident in themselves, people who are decision makers in the local community are invited to join. And then, over the period of a year, they don't talk about policy. They talk about each other's lives. They try to understand who each is. The people who experience poverty understand that if you are the decision maker at the Department of Work and Pensions, you have difficulties in your life too. That you have 
problems that you have to solve and you have forces acting upon you. And by sitting together in the same room, after a year, you then talk about how do we improve these services? How do we improve people's lives? And that idea of relationship and that idea of actually listening to those who experience poverty and using that as the ground material for how you make good policy rather than these graphs is really, really positive. And the last thing I'll say, because I've gone a bit long, is that the f this idea starts in Scotland and the Scottish government is much more sort of open to those ideas than the Westminster government currently. But in Scotland, senior civil servants have a truth commissioner or a former truth commissioner that they're paired with. And they have to have a cup of tea with them. And I don't know what policy has changed because of those cups of tea. But I am absolutely certain that they have changed more policies than all the graphs that I can draw. That knowing that you have to face the person of, who, who feels the effects of the thing, policies you are writing, and knowing you have to understand it, and understanding who they are, is going to have a profound effect. So I'm sorry if you wanted to be pressed. I refuse to do it. OK, thank you. Yeah, the idea, the rise of meritocracy is a sort of a, a fable written by, uh, it's Toby Young's dad, which is very, which seems a very weird thing. But it was actually saying why meritocracy is fundamentally a bad, I bad way of running a society. But some people took the opposite message. It's a bit like Monopoly was a game that was invented by a socialist to explain why capitalism was ultimately doomed. And actually people took it as a way of, well, hey, I can be Donald Trump and I can win. <laughs> so the, I, for me, the real problem comes when you decide what merit is. Who gets to decide what merit is? That we, people think, how do I phrase this? If you're of a certain political persuasion, you think that the rules of society are fair. And, your, and what you must do is get people to fit into those rules. So universal credit, it wants to, m there's this view that these are people for whom society, aren't doing well in society. So if we improve them, then they'll do well because the rules in society are fine. And then you've got all these problems, you then have to deal with problems as to why certain groups do very badly. Why are BAM people much more likely to be in, experience poverty? Why are people with disability? Why are, why are women more likely to experience poverty? And the easiest solution to that is that we've written the rules wrong. And, that, and I think the hardest thing to do is to not believe the rules are like gravity. Is to, believe that the, is to understand that the rules of society are things that we created. You can blame God for physics. Eco economics, it's our fault. And once you understand that economics is our fault, you then go, well, why not change it? And that's the point. And, I th and the reason I'm positive is I think there's a whole generation of people who didn't grow up thinking that market economics, as defined by Thatcher, is gravity. They're able to think outside that and say, actually, I don't, I don't need that. I don't want that. We can define something better. I'm not sure if I answered your question, but I'm, that's the best I can do. Aquinas in Summa, a big theological work, justifies why you should have private property. And his justification of private property, we had a real problem with that as early Christians. Because, you know, in the early church things were held in common. And should things be held, and, and, uh, and if all things belong to God, then uh, 
full things belong to God, then how can I have ownership rights over them? And I'm, I'm, I'm looking at David because he wrote something, Prosperity, with something in about 1992, which said all this. And I'm just quoting you. <laughs> but it said that the reason you can have private property is, oh, is that if it makes people look after it and that it promotes the common good. So the reason to have private property is that it promotes the common good. It is looking after God's things and then using them to help the society around you. If you are of a particular political persuasion, private property is absolute. They rank countries by how absolute your grip and your control of something is if you own it. And the thing that, we, that would change how our economy worked was to loosen that grip. Would be to say, and we kind of, uh, and again, you might think ownership's nine tenths of the law and all these sort of things, but tr trust me, if they want to build a motorway where your house is, your ownership is meaningless. It will go. We already do remove ownership of things from people for the common good. Why not expand that? Why not make ownership of certain assets conditional on them being used for the common good? Why not say, and then you can say, well, in which case taxation becomes much more, becomes much more normal because I recognize that this is common property and therefore some of the profits I make on it obviously belongs to the other, other people. So the one policy is to start ebbing away at that idea of ownership and thinking about what it really means. Uh, we largely do our tax policy work through uh, Cat J, uh, Christians for Tax, ju tax Justice, which, uh, which Hannah is the link person to at the moment. And I think we have said quite a lot of things about We've said a lot of things about the legitimacy of tax and we've said a lot of things about how we would wish to spend tax. And we, the church has been very good at saying that when the state says you should pay tax, you should. And if you monkey about in such a way as you can get just in the right side of the law, that's really not acceptable, that you should pay tax as, as government intended. And, and where we have been less good and where I hope Cat J will bring our thinking on, is around what a fair taxation system would look like. So not just pay the tax by the rules as they are written. How should we write those rules better? And really, I think it, it started to become as clear as day that wealth is the way in which is the way in which households are are getting more and more of their buying power now rather than income and we traditionally we tax income very well and we've got good mechanisms for doing it that wealth is the thing that needs to be taxed because lots of people have no income but their wealth is increasing and increasing and increasing I can remember uh, uh, 10 years ago i uh, was writing something for the methodist church on tax policy and i phoned up a company in the isle of man and they produced a proposal so that JPIT members would only have to pay uh, tax as if they were being paid six hours a week on minimum wage by, by, a complex mechanism of, by a complex mechanism of creating a fund in which our salaries were paid into and inflated. But fortunately, senior members of the Connectional team at the, end, at the time wouldn't allow us to do so, which was a shame. <laughs> but those sort of games are easy. And they're easy because you can, you, can, you, you can enrich yourself by inflating your wealth rather than getting it in income. Yes. The, the answer to that is, for, to, to both of those is yes. But I think something that's really informative, the story that's really informative is that in East London in 2002, there was a huge meeting. It was convened by the church about why, there, why communities weren't doing anything together anymore. Why people were saying the sort of things you were saying about, you know, what, what is it that means that our kids are playing by themselves and they don't see their fathers? What is it that we don't have, uh, that 
parents aren't, you know, are fighting rather than seeing their, are fighting when they're at home and they're running about and they're, you know, they're working at night. And that meeting, they had this long discussion. And out of that meeting came the London Living Wage. Because the reason they came to the conclusion, the reason was that people were having to work so many hours just to meet the very basics that everything else in their life was squeezed and that there was no time that could be protected because if you protected that time then you were thrown away and you would never get the shift again. So it's a problem that's known about and living wage is a good way, is one way of solving it. I think for me and maybe I know it's the case in Birmingham and in London, it may be here. One of the other big issues now is private tenancy, which is that when you build yourself into a community, under, if you're under minimum assured tenancy, you can be thrown out at virtually no notice, and then you have to set up somewhere else. And that's expensive and it's a faff, but it also means you don't set, you don't set down roots in community, and it makes it really hard for people and especially children. Uh, and I, I know some teachers who just tell me about the, the, the f sheer hassle they have to go through because you have to settle new people in. And just as you settled them in, at six months, their, their house is sold from under them and then they have to go off to somewhere else and the kids go to another school. And that process is repeated and repeated and repeated and it's no good for anyone. So around mental health, there's really good data that suggests that shift work and secure work is, you know, the, 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 the government line is that work is good for you. And like almost every slogan, it's not quite as simple as that. Good work is good for you, bad work is bad for you. And the sort of low paid, the sort of low paid insecure work, you can, the bit I like, because I used to do, do uh, vaccine design and I used to take blood out of small children and things. Uh, you can take blood out of people and you can see that they've got higher stress markers, you can see that they've got what's called systematic, systemic inflammation and that that is higher in people in those insecure jobs than it is in people who are unemployed. So actually in terms of your well-being going from unemployed to this this form of work is actually worse for you. Um, there's good data, sort of correlative data about mental health as well, which you can go into. So bad, wor bad work is worse than unemployment. And yet universal credit is absolutely geared to shifting people to bad work. And their data shows us clearly, in as much as it does anything, what it does is shift you into bad work. And that seems an extraordinarily foolish thing and short term I'd thing to do. I've quoted Wesley, so I'll, I'll quote another great man, Bernie Eccleston, uh, who said, business is a game and money is the way of keeping score. And for some people, that is the purpose of money. It's a way of keeping score. And, uh, and that, is a re that is a problem. I, I think I agree with everything you say, but I would caution. I think the comfortable place for... Uh, for for um, a middle class Methodist like me is to be, is to say the systems are bad to the poor and the rich are awful. That, that, is my, that is my comfortable zone and I'm not entirely sure that it's constructive or accurate. I think one of the best, you know, if you, if you believe in, the, in providence, when I started this work, I, I'm working on poverty in 2012. My wife was stationed to a place called Barnes. Now, Barnes is in... Richmond is the posh bit of London, and Barnes is the posh bit of Richmond. And when we went to visit the house, we had a Peugeot 106 with a lot of duct tape holding it together. And uh, I nearly hit a Porsche as I was parking up. And you know, I got out in my jeans and my t-shirt with my accent and people thought I was going to tarmac their drive. They had no <laughs> idea. But I went to the Barnes Methodist Church and the organist there is a wonderful man who he's, trustee of, he's a trustee of uh, Fair Tr Trade Foundation, but he's also, 
He was also a senior manager in BP. And that is an area which had a lot of people who were really wealthy. And I think the providence came because I think my natural reaction would have been to say bad things about the rich. But when I knew the organist at Barnes, he's just a lovely man. He cares about the world. He may have different views about the world and how you care about it, and I have, I've had rows like you wouldn't believe. But he does care about the world. And I think, actually, lots of people who are wealthy, they have a different experience of the world, and that experience is valid and is worth listening to. And as long as they recognize their wealth and recognize that experience is limited, there's a really good, constructive conversation to be had. But what you're saying is, undoubtedly, there's some of them. <laughs>